humor, though. I've watched it before. Also, I need to Okay, so, yeah, I added that link there with our pretty picture. And, of course, as I was saying, if I was the one wearing the Doppler effect, I would have had that button here, but then I would have had design like that instead of the vertical stripes because, you know. But on that show, they do have a physics professor who advises to make sure their science is right, so they're generally pretty good. All right. Dispersion of light. <laughs> You've probably all played with the prism and looked at how it makes the pretty colors. We use diffraction gratings to break light up into its colors, but a prism does the same thing because light travels at different speeds for different colors in the glass. Now remember, in a vacuum, what's the speed of light? <laughs> okay. 29979245 meters per second, or roughly 300 million meters per second. Yeah. It's the same for all colors in a vacuum. But when you're in a medium that's not vacuum, like the Earth's atmosphere, or water, or glass, then you have different speeds for different colors. And because of those different speeds, remember last class period I talked about refraction, the bending of light when it goes from one speed material to another speed? Since the different colors have different speeds, they will refract or bend by different amounts. And that's what spreads the colors out. So that's why you see the pretty rainbow effect when light goes through a prism. And we call that spreading of the colors dispersion. Now lenses are probably what you think of when you think of something that's going to focus light. And you know, people who wear eyeglasses, like Megan, have lenses there that are focusing light to improve their vision. Well, telescopes have lenses also to do the same thing. The lenses work on the principle of refraction. Now, I've just talked about refraction again, but what is the definition of refraction? Because of... Remember the example of walking down the sidewalk and then into the sand at the beach? Mm -hmm. And why did you bend your path that you're walking? The material that it goes through because of the speed that it goes through it. So because of changing speed. So a lens can basically be thought of like a whole bunch of prisms and light comes in hits a surface, bends, goes out, bends a second time, and makes the light, so whether it comes to the top of the lens or the bottom of the lens, it comes together. When the light comes together, we say it comes to a focus. And so a lens will focus light because of refraction. And so we use that focusing, bringing the light together, to produce an image using lenses. And then we have a sensor like the eye or a camera or you know, photographic film or a CCD, something in the focal plane, the plane where all of the light comes to a focus. Now, when I say it comes to a focus, you know, let's say we have the jolly red giant here, and then I put my lens in front of this giant. Okay, let's not make it a huge lens. I put my lens in front of this giant, and light that comes from this guy will go like this, and all the light from the top of his head will come together at one location. All the light from the bottom of his feet will likewise come together at one location. Those are supposed to have met there. There they meet better. And so we have a plane which in two dimensions looks like a straight line, where things come into focus. Now, if you look at this, which one of these two was the head, the green or the magenta? Green. So here we have the head, and I'm not going to try to draw him. Here we have the feet. Notice that the image is going to be upside down because it's going to have the head below the feet, whereas when he was standing, he had the head above the feet. 
And so when you make the image with the lens, it makes each part of the object comes to a focus at a different location so that your image has a complete reproduction of the object, but inverted. And that's, of course, a key element in a refracting telescope. We'll see other kinds of telescopes here in just a few moments. First, I think it's a clicker question, but that's taking too long. Yeah. Okay, telescopes that use lenses to focus are called refracting telescopes. The reason they're refracting telescopes is very, very simple, because they're using refraction of light to focus the light. That's the bending of light when it goes through the lenses. And they have built large refractors. The largest of them is, I think, in Wisconsin, the Yerkes Telescope. And it has an objective. Objective means the lens that faces the object that I think is like two meters in diameter. It's a really big lens. But there are some problems with making a big lens like that. One of the big problems is that glass is heavy. And you're generally trying to support it on the edges. And if you try to support that glass on the edges, it will start to sag. Everything sags over time. We, you've heard people say that glass is a fluid. It's kind of technically correct. Realistically, it's kind of silly. Um, an example I've heard people say is if you look at the windows in an old church, you can see the variations, the wave of nature because the glass has flowed. That's not true. When one physicist decided to sit down and put some numbers to it, and he determined that all of the lead that they used to hold the window panes in back then would have flowed out long, long before you'd have enough flowing of glass to see any variation whatsoever. Right? The glass would flow super slow. You wouldn't notice it. But everything flows, and if it's heavy enough, you would have those lenses sag or flow under their own weight. Also, you have the problem of chromatic aberration. Who knows what the word chroma means? Color. Color. So chromatic aberration, aberration is an error in the image. Chromatic aberration is an error with the color. And it's because different colors refract by different amounts. That dispersion makes different colors actually focus at different locations. So anytime you use a lens to focus light, you have that problem. Hence, a simple lens system never gives you a great image. So how do they try to correct that? Like, let's say you have a, a, a what is it, Nokia that has the, it has a 21 lens system in their phone. The reason it has those 21 lenses, one of them is to take care of that chromatic aberration. You can actually correct for it with multiple lenses. And the more lenses you have, the better you can correct for it. Now, there's other reasons they're going with 21 lenses, but that's one of them, chromatic aberration. So chromatic aberration is another problem with using refractors. Yes? I saw this video yesterday where they superpooled helium, mm -hmm. and basically they turned it into hyper, a hyperliquid or superliquid. Um, they call it superfluid. Yeah, superfluid. And so does that have anything like, and basically what happens is once they cool it down to a little bit, it just flows through a glass Mm -hmm. Well, not a glass container, but it'll flow through things like a filter or paper. Okay. Well, okay. It, it'll Maybe. climb the walls of a glass container, and then it looks like it's dripping out the bottom, oh, but it actually okay. climbed the walls and went around. Oh, okay. okay, never mind then. I was going to ask if it was actually going through and if that had anything. Yeah. It, there, there are different demonstrations they'll do with it. One of them is having a filter paper that has a really tiny porosity. And what happens when you have a superfluid is the surface tension goes to zero. That is the force that's holding one molecule to another drops to zero. So then each molecule can go through any hole that's the size of the molecule or bigger. So helium being ideal, it's monatomic. So if a helium atom will fit through the hole, it'll go through and it's superfluid. Whereas when it's not superfluid, it's trying to hold on to other heliums and won't go through. So that's, they put a filter paper that it won't go through. You get it cold enough so it's a superfluid and suddenly it just drains right through like there's nothing there. Because each, each atom is just going yeah. through the holes. Um, the other one is um, capillarity. It, it still will attach to the walls of the glass. It has lower energy touching those, and so it climbs up, and then gravity brings it down. And so it's actually just sheeting up the entire side 
outside coming back together, and at the center it meets, and that's where you see it draining from the center. Okay, sorry, that actually wasn't astronomy. It was physics, and I do that. Okay, um, <clears throat> moving on then from refractors. Another kind of telescope you can make is a reflecting telescope. That's using a mirror instead of a lens. A mirror, you can make a surface that is curved, so if light hits the top, it bends down. If light hits the bottom, it bends up. And so once again, you can make light converge, come together, and come to a focus. So a mirror can be used to do the same things a lens can be used. But mirrors have some big advantages over lenses. One of the biggest advantages is that a mirror has a single surface. With a single surface, you only have to grind one surface. For a lens, you have two surfaces, so you have to grind two surfaces. So it's half as much work to make a precision mirror as it is to make a precision lens. A second advantage of the mirrors are that mirrors, you don't have light refracting. You have it reflecting. And reflection is the same for all colors, always. So you don't have any kind of chromatic aberration introduced with a mirror because you don't have the difference in focus for different colors. A third big advantage of mirrors is you can make them light because you can make them pretty thin. You know, if you're making a two meter diameter lens, it's going to be pretty thick and that's going to be a really heavy glass. But when you're making a mirror, you can make the whole mirror so it's curved and it doesn't have to be very thick, doesn't have to have a lot of material. And finally for my list, you can support a mirror on the back side. So you can support the entire thing and you don't have to worry about sagging. So there's a lot of big advantages for the mirrors. Hence, astronomers almost exclusively use reflectors when they're making telescopes or studying light. So while you might get a refractor for your home, if you get a larger telescope, you're going to get a reflector. If you're going to get a research grade telescope, it's all, pretty much always a reflector. And I may or may not at the end of class have a chance to talk about one final advantage of the reflector, the um, adjustable optics. Here's a couple designs of reflectors. Now before we focus on those, let me look, show you the design of a telescope that's a refractor. A Galilean telescope is your simplest telescope. You have two lenses. One of them is out facing your object. So here my object is either a tree or a feather, depends on you know, how you see my artistry. So the lens that is facing the object is called the objective lens. And the lens that is near to the eyeball, this is how we in physics draw an eyeball. The lens that is near to the eyeball is called the eyepiece. Yes, but it's an eye. <laughs> It's, it's the best I can do. What happens with this is you have light from the object, goes to the objective, and comes to a focus. There is a simple equation that's the, called the thin lens equation that tells us that if the object is very far away, if you're in astronomy, you're only worried about very far objects, right? So for this class, all objects are very far away, and that means that the image will always be located at the focal point of the objective lens. The eyepiece, now, I really need to move something because my, my picture is really out of whack. Eh. My picture could not represent a real system with it out there. Okay, that light then is the object for the eyepiece and you place the eyepiece so it's a focal length of the eyepiece away from the eyepiece and then that light, well there's other rays that come here so the light's going to go like this. It will come out parallel like this and make an image 
That says image. Can you read it? Yeah. Makes an image that's infinitely far away. Why infinitely far away? So your eyeball can relax. When your eyeballs are relaxed, they see as far away as you can focus. When you strain your eyes, you do that so you can adjust the focus to somewhere closer. So they make the telescope so you see the image infinitely far away, so your eyeballs relax. Now, if you don't have perfect vision, you adjust the focus so it's closer, so it's as far as you can see. What has been done in this process is kind of subtle. The angle that this tree would have made with the eye would have been really small. But by using this telescope, it makes a much bigger angle. Remember, we talked about the size of things in the sky are measured by their angular size. The telescope is increasing the angular size of the objects so that they appear, excuse me, they appear bigger to us. And so, I mean, that's the point of a telescope. Make something that is far, make a bigger angle, appear bigger. So it magnifies far objects. One, all of this stuff, you kind of need to know the basics of how it works. I mean, I didn't even write any equations so far. You don't have to know any equations up to here. There are two equations you need to know. Number one, the length of the telescope is equal to the sum of the two focal lengths, right? You can see that just by looking here. And the magnification of the telescope Technically, there's a minus sign here. Focal length of the objective divided by focal length of the eyepiece. That minus sign is because your image is inverted. It's upside down. Focal length of the objective divided by focal length of the eyepiece tells you you want a long focal length for the objective, short focal length for the eyepiece to get a big magnification. And you change the magnification of the telescope simply by changing the eyepiece. Change the eyepiece to a shorter focal length, what's that going to do to the magnification? It's going to make the magnification go up. It's also going to make the telescope shorter. So when you put a shorter eyepiece in, or excuse me, shorter focal length eyepiece to increase the magnification, it also is going to be going closer into the telescope. So hopefully, next week we'll go out to where it's dark, I'll bring out the telescope. We'll have a different lab experience, and you'll see the different eyepieces and why they have those different standoffs is because of different focal lengths. The question is, I didn't answer it. I just thought, what am I wondering what O and E, but it's an eyepiece. Object of an eyepiece. Oh, okay. So you do need to know those two equations that I put up there in the top corner. And of course, when it comes to test time, these are on the equation sheet for the test. So you don't have to memorize them, but you have to be able to use them, know what they mean. So that's how we make a Galilean telescope. Now there are other variations of telescopes. You can put a field lens in and things like that. We're not worried about that. These here are different styles of reflectors. This one's called the prime focus. This one here, the Cassegrain, that is the dominant telescope design. And then there's the Newtonian focus. The Newtonian focus has a mirror in the center that reflects light out in the side of the barrel. So if you see a telescope and the eyepiece is in the side of the barrel, the middle of the telescope, that's a Newtonian design, obviously named after Isaac Newton. The Cassegrain design has a mirror in the center as well, but it reflects light through a hole in the back. So when you're looking through the back of the telescope, that's where the eyepiece is, then you have a Cassegrain design. And this prime focus one has the camera mounted inside of the telescope. And I think somebody had said something to that effect, um, talking about telescopes, that that was the detecting device. This here is the dominant design because it's the shortest. If you look at the light coming in, you have light coming in and it hits your objective is actually this mirror on the back side. Why is it the objective? It's the first one the light from the object strikes. Here, the text has called it a primary mirror. The focal length of the eyepiece is always short compared to the focal length of the objective. So basically, the length of this telescope is the length of the objective because the eyepiece is small. I mean, 
You have to add them together to get the true answer. So if you look at this telescope here, the length of the telescope is equal to the focal length of the objective. That is the length from where you have your detector to where the primary mirror is. If you look at this one here, you basically take the radius away. It's one radius of your telescope shorter than the length of the primary focus. This one here, the light goes up and back down. And so that means the length of this one here is equal to the, length, the focal length of the objective divided by 2 because it bent back on itself. So here the length was equal to the focal length of the objective. Here the length was equal to the focal length of the objective minus the radius of your telescope. And here the length is one half the focal length of the objective. Making it shorter makes it smaller and more manageable. So that's why this one here is the dominant one. It's the shortest variety. Now if you look at it, notice this secondary mirror is actually curved. It's doing some focusing action with that secondary mirror as well. You have the primary mirror's curve, the secondary mirror. This one here was a flat mirror that just redirected the light. This one here didn't have a mirror. You have an eyepiece right there for looking through. This one here doesn't show it, but there's going to be an eyepiece right there as well. Actually, maybe I drew that. Yeah, I did draw that eyepiece. <laughs> but there's going to be an eyepiece here or an eyepiece there for doing the final focusing so that you can view it. When we go out with our telescope, I'll ask you which type of telescope it is. I'm hoping you'll be able to identify. Of course, you can probably guess right now. So which style is it going to be? Cassegrain. Yeah, Cassegrain, of course. That's the type we always use. Is that a question? Well, you look for the eyepiece. Okay, if, if you have a long straight barrel, it's going to have, you know, with a lens in the front, then it's going to be one of these, you know, a Galilean probably. If you have just a piece of glass in the front, that's what mine has, a piece of glass. It basically keeps it clean inside. It's, it actually is a little bit of a focusing element. It's called a Schmidt corrector. Um, but basically, it's a piece of glass in the front. Well, then it's probably going to be a reflector instead of a refractor. And then you just look where the eyepiece is. If the eyepiece is back here, it's cast grain. If the eyepiece is over here, it's Newtonian. If there's no eyepiece, then it must be that. Now, here's another kind of telescope for X-rays. X-rays are very high-energy photons. Remember we talked about... A photon has an energy of Planck's constant times the frequency, e equals hf. X-rays have very high frequencies, hence very high energies of photons. You cannot use normal materials with those the way we do for other kinds of telescopes. So to make a telescope for X-rays is much more complicated. They have a bunch of cylindrical mirrors. <laughs> that the light is redirected by to make it come to a focus. Those mirrors are you know, essentially metal surfaces, if I understand them correctly. So the design of an X-ray telescope is quite a bit different than the design of the other telescopes, but you still have to have a way of focusing the rays. Okay, so our first clicker question. What type of visible light telescope is used predominantly for scientific investigations? And I know some people have said Cassegrain, which is correct, but that's not the type of category I'm looking at here. I'm just looking at, is it a reflector, a refractor, a diffractor, or a distractor? Use your clicker. Actually, he probably already did. Yeah, he did. Uh, Okay, we're all in. We had nine that said reflector, five that said refractor, and none that said the two that don't exist. That's very good. <laughs> um, a diffractor would be one that diffraction is light bending around corners. Never heard of using that to try to make a telescope, but that's what diffraction is. A distractor is a question that is there to distract you from the right answers. 
I figured this would be the perfect place to use that. So reflector or refractor? The correct answer was reflector. Remember, we had the bonuses of the reflectors, lighter lenses, single surface, no chromatic aberration, easy to support, a lot of benefits for the reflector, and also you can make them shorter than you can the refractor. So here is, <laughs> here is a, I, I believe that picture that I showed you yesterday was part of the Keck um, twin telescopes. This here is showing you the actual mirror from the Keck telescope that has 36 large mirrors. It's a twin, so there's two of them. 36 large mirrors. You look at these mirrors. Each one is its own little hexagon, and they fit together. How many people have heard, well, you've all heard of the Hubble Space Telescope, right? I mean, you'd have to be under a rock to not know of that by now. What's the next space telescope? It used to be called the Next Generation Space Telescope, NGST. But now it has a much more permanent and wonderful name. Hubble? No, that's the current one. The Next Generation one. Wah, wah. W. <laughs> it's the web space telescope, you fools. Come on. <laughs> Why else would I be all excited about it? It's named after James Webb, an administrator of NASA. So the first. Uh, he's not. Yeah, I wish. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's no actual relation. Neither is the politician, Jim Webb. Um, or Raiders offensive lineman, was it Jamarcus Webb? I don't know. I, well, there used to be an all pro offensive lineman, Richmond Webb. We're the same age. I just claimed that we were twins, you know, and I was raised in Liberia. I just said, you know, we got separated there, but yeah. Anyway, so back to the topic. Um, the next generation space telescope now renamed the James Webb space telescope has mosaic lenses like this. Those lenses are going to be much bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope has. Why? Because bigger is better. What can you do with a big lens that you can't, or big mirror in this case, that is better than with a small mirror? The, that's a little more complicated, but there's a very simple thing that you always have. There's two simple things, one we've learned. More light, that's the key. The light gathering power is proportional to the area of the, the primary optic. And so making it big, I think it's a three meter objective for the Webb Space Telescope. So it's gonna be very big, so it gathers a lot more light, can see far fainter things. Move forward. Okay. Going back to the spectrum of light, we've looked at the spectrum of light. We looked at it when we started this chapter or this unit that the last test ostensibly was over. The next test will include this material on it. Unless you think, wait, it said that we were, you know, that it was on the first exam and the, the second exam will cover from the cutoff from the first exam. But here's another look at the spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Slightly different. This comes from NASA giving attribution. And it has some additional information. Now we have here things that are the size of the wavelength. So gamma rays are on the order of the size of an atomic nucleus going out to radio waves on the order of the size of a building. But, and notice the visible light is right in here. This top thing penetrates Earth atmosphere. We only see with our eyes, clearly. That's no one would be shocked at that statement. Because we only see with our eyes, we can only see electromagnetic radiation at the visible range if it comes through the sky. In fact, that we see stars says, yes, visible light comes through the sky. But that doesn't have to be true for all wavelengths of light. And so, in fact, you can look there, and there are only two bands where light can get through the atmosphere. What are those two bands? Okay, visible light and radio waves 
a little bit in the microwave, right? And a little bit in the infrared. You want x-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet rays? Forget about it. Now, there's some ultraviolet that gets through the atmosphere, otherwise we wouldn't get our nice suntans. But for the most part, it's blocked. And I'm going to show you another graph that illustrates how much is blocked. So the atmosphere really only allows us to see in two wavelength ranges. Now, let me bring a little bit of my creationist belief in here. I believe that God created the laws of the universe and God created us. And I believe that God created us with vision so we could see the light that comes through the atmosphere. You know, we could have vision that's in the ultraviolet and then the sky would just be dark. Right? We wouldn't see anything coming through. But we have light in the visible spectrum. And I believe God created that for us. We could also have vision in the radio spectrum and see through the atmosphere, but as you'll see later, we wouldn't see very much. Now, if you, instead of believing in creation like I do, if you believe in evolution, then you would likely develop a scenario that says that there was an advantage to being able to see in the daytime, and so as vision randomly developed, and if you believe in evolution, you believe that our very complex optical systems developed in the pre-Cambrian period, because of the Cambrian explosion, you have all of these different um, varieties of animals that have very similar eyes. So back then, pre-Cambrian, the vision developed so that they could see the light that was available during the day. But then I, Richard Webb, countered by saying, wouldn't it make more sense if it was for evolutionary purposes to have vision in the infrared? Now remember, we give off radiation. All of you are giving off electromagnetic waves. We can't see it because it's not in the range that our eyes can see. But if we could see it infrared, we could see everybody, light or dark, because we'd see the light coming off of them. So if we had infrared vision, as a hunter, that would really be an advantage. Because I could see you in the dark. I could hunt in the dark, I could hunt in the light. I would be a better hunter. So to me, an evolutionary design would have ended up with vision in the infrared rather than the visible, or maybe crossing over, but not just visible light. So, you know, since I believe in a creator, we have what seems to make more sense to me for us to enjoy and appreciate nature. So, just getting my little religious <laughs> aspect in there. Another clicker question. Which two ranges of the electromagnetic spectrum is the atmosphere transparent to? Just a question we just had. Um, yes, click the two that you believe are correct and then enter. It will only accept two, so I'll try to put all seven in. I will uh, name the people who haven't answered yet so you know. Kendrick, Alina, Satish, Satish, Eliezer, Labirth. Now it's just Alina, Satish, Eliezer, and Labirth. Don't you have your clerk of labor? It, you haven't. Remember, you have to put in the two that you think are correct and hit enter. Uh, it won't accept three. It'll only accept two of them. Yeah, but it, it only submitted two of them. Okay. Answers we got. Ten, one, five, ten, one. I actually went through that this morning. I had one that was supposed to have three correct answers, and it would only accept two. And so everybody entered them in in alphabetical order, it turned out there was only one that showed one of them that was correct, and I was beside myself, and they're like, no, no, we hit that. <laughs> okay, so, looking at our answers here, 10 people said radio, that's a majority, 10 people said visible, that's a majority, 5 people said infrared, that's not a majority, but that's a pretty big number. Infrared 
is kind of a tweener. Let me go to the next slide to explain exactly why. Here we see the, uh-oh, okay, there we go. Here we see the opacity of the sky. That is how much it absorbs light. So if it's up here at the top, it's absorbing everything, 100%. And so here's the visible spectrum where it's transmitting almost 100%, absorbing almost zero. Over here is what we call the radio window, where it is absorbing nothing. Here is the infrared region. And in that infrared region, it's not absorbing 100%, but it's also not perfectly transmitting. So it's somewhere in between, so that answer, you know, by people answering it. I'm okay with that as long as you understand <laughs> your answer, the fact that five out of the group said it instead of ten out of the group kind of indicates how well it is allowing light through. <laughs> now, we have all heard about the greenhouse effect. Is the greenhouse effect real? Yes. Yes, it is. What would happen if we had no greenhouse effect? We would freeze. We'd be popsicles without the greenhouse effect. It is a vital thing for human life. So then the question comes, why is it a big deal if it's a vital thing? Well, let us consider Venus. The planet Venus is very similar to us, 95% our radius. But, well, it is closer to the sun. It's like only 77% of our distance away from the sun, something like that. But Venus has a very thick atmosphere that produces an incredibly large greenhouse effect. So we say that it has a runaway greenhouse effect. And result, it's super hot on Venus. We can't have life as we know it on Venus. There have been a number of spacecraft that have gone to Venus, and the longest lived one I think lasted about an hour before it was destroyed by the caustic environment, both combination of high temperatures and some nasty chemicals. So that's a greenhouse effect gone bad. On the other hand, Mars, now Mars is 50% farther from the sun than we are, and it's a fair amount smaller than us. Because it's smaller, it can't hold on to much atmosphere. And so it has virtually no greenhouse effect. The result there, on a bright sunny day, it's comfortable, just like it is outside here today. Right? Temperatures outside today, highest temperatures on Mars are somewhere around 70 Fahrenheit. But then when it's nighttime, you <laughs> freeze. And so it's not habitable by humans. You would have to get more atmosphere there both to breathe and to normalize the temperatures. So we, we are somewhere in between. We have to have a greenhouse effect. What do you suppose is the primary greenhouse gas? The number one greenhouse gas is this gas called H2O, otherwise known as water. Now there are some other greenhouse gases that are not nearly as big an effect. Um, you have methane and you have, um, well, somebody said nitrogen. There, there are some nitrogen compounds involved in the greenhouse effect. And then there's carbon dioxide. The one you hear about all the time is carbon dioxide. <laughs> CO2, I almost wrote CO2 again because it's long to write carbon dioxide. Why do we hear about carbon dioxide if it's a truly minor contributor to the greenhouse effect? Okay, it's the one that we can directly affect. The amount of water vapor in the air we don't have much control of that. That's pretty much just a function of the temperature. And if you have a higher temperature, you're going to have more water vapor, which means you have a higher greenhouse effect. But you're also going to have more clouds, and the clouds increase the Earth's albedo. That is the reflectivity of the Earth, because you're going to have light that comes down and hits the clouds and reflects off. And that would cool the Earth. So the, the water, there's some self-balancing things there. But the carbon dioxide, we produce a lot of it. Now, carbon dioxide is generally absorbed by water. 
So the oceans have absorbed a lot of carbon dioxide, deposited as rock, as calcium carbonate, for instance. Um, and so carbon dioxide has been cleaned from the atmosphere for the most part. It's believed that the reason Venus has this runaway greenhouse effect is because it never had liquid water to absorb the carbon dioxide and precipitate it out as rock. And so it's carbon dioxide is left in the atmosphere. So liquid water is important for us to not have the runaway greenhouse effect. It absorbs carbon dioxide, but when the temperatures get higher, the ocean emits carbon dioxide. It, the carbon dioxide it has been absorbing, it lets go of. And so historically, when people are trying to determine how much carbon dioxide has been in the atmosphere, in the, well, that was the wrong way. What the temperatures were in the past, one of the things they do is they look at the carbon dioxide. Because when the temperature goes higher, the carbon dioxide levels naturally go up. And so we have a funny switch. We're saying the carbon dioxide now is causing the greenhouse effect. But when we're looking at the past for temperatures, we say we can gauge the temperature by how much carbon dioxide was given up by the ocean. It, it's a very complex system. And I am a, a skeptic. The, the hardcore people would say I'm a science denier. I don't think we have evidence to say that man has fundamentally affected the temperatures on Earth. We will learn later about astronomy things that affect the temperatures on Earth. And there, you know, the Milankovitch hypothesis gives strong reason to believe that we should be warming up now. The question is only, are we warming up faster than astronomy says we should be? It could be that man is related to this, right? I'm not saying we're not, but I'm skeptical. I don't think we have enough evidence for that conclusion. But I do always end by saying, God did give us responsibility to take care of this earth. And so we should not be just polluting things and saying, ha, that's the way of it. We should be trying to be green, if you will, to be responsible for this creation. Once again, I have waxed into a little bit of... This is exactly what our telescope look like, looks like, a schmidt cassegrain design. Um, I'm just going to go past there because I see I only have five minutes. I want to look at the kinds of things. I talked last class pretty about this, but I want to look at it more carefully. The kinds of things you look at with different wavelength range telescopes. So here, once again, is that same picture of the Arecibo telescope. And one of the main things they look at is 21 centimeter spin flip transition from hydrogen. What they're able to see is where you have cool hydrogen gas in the universe. You, you, you certainly can't see that with visible light, right? But this telescope allows them to identify where the cool hydrogen gas is. Now let's take a look at some pictures from the Arecibo telescope compared to visible light. These are two pictures of Jupiter. The lower one is pretty clear, right? That's visible light. The upper one is looking at the cool molecular hydrogen gas you see completely different detail. The hydrogen gas tells you a different story than the visible light does. So you can see where there would be value to looking at different wavelengths because you see different details. I mean, did you know that there are, you know, that there is essentially a ring of hydrogen gas around Jupiter? No, probably not. The fact is there are rings around all of the gas giants. Not hydrogen gas necessarily, but rings of actual particulate. There's rings of particulate there. And so you have that interesting structure from the hydrogen gas that you can see. Also, which one has more detail visible? <laughs> yeah, the visible clearly has more detail. That's because the resolution, the smallest thing you can see, is proportional to the wavelength of light. And the, <clears throat> well, the, the shorter the wavelength of light, the smaller the detail you can see, and the larger the opening of the telescope the better the detail you can see. So because this has such low resolution, they need to make really big telescopes to try to get better resolution. Or, we'll see in just a moment, use interferometry. So moving to the next one, infrared telescopes. <laughs> you can't see it very well, but here's a, an infrared telescope. They can look at cool gases, gases that are somewhere between 10 and 100 kelvins, or 10 and 500 kelvins. We, by the way, are between 10 and 500 kelvins. We're around 300 kelvins. They can penetrate through clouds. Here's some pictures taken in infrared. Pretty colors, right? False. Those are what we call false color because that's not visible light. You can't define a color for light that you can't see with your eye, right? So it's a false color. They're not really pretty colors. What the people who make these do is they look at, okay, so I have this 
light that comes from this source, this light that comes from this source, and they will assign colors so you can see contrasts in information. So they kind of randomly choose the colors to show you what they're trying to illustrate. So they're false color, they don't have a direct mapping to colors or even necessarily wavelength in the same order as the visible spectrum. But they're there to help you see details. Um, before I answer your question, these are all looking at exactly the same location in the sky. If you look carefully, you'll see, for instance, this detail right here is this detail right here and right here. But by looking at different wavelength ranges, this is 3.6 to 8 micrometers. This one is 24 micrometers, so three times longer wavelength than the first one. This one here is a large range from 4.5 to 70 micrometers. You see different details. What was your question, Seth? I was just going to ask, so like, the way that they map the, or assign the colors, mm -hmm. if it has anything to do, like what, how do they determine like, what, what are, what's the variable that they assign colors to? Is it, like, um, it, it can depend. It could be the emission from a certain type of atom is this color and from another type of atom is this color. It could be things that are coming toward us. I'm going to color more red or more blue. Things are going away. I'm going to color more red. It depends on what they're trying to bring out, how they'll choose their colors. So they kind of have to tell you what the colors stand for for you to really do any interpreting. And so here I can't do any interpreting. All I can do is say, Ooh, look at that. Yeah. Okay, here's an X-ray telescope, <laughs> complicated telescope. Not going to worry about it. It's used to observe very hot materials, X-ray pictures, something like this. Here I have a key for what the colors are. Red is for oxygen. Yellow is for iron. So I can see that there's some iron in this region here. Blue is for the expanding shock wave. They used the Doppler shift information to determine its speed. Not speed coming towards us or weight necessarily, but its speed. So we can see that it's expanding outward from the blue. And so here they used a couple different criteria to give it the false color so you can see what's going on and interpret it. And so this legend here is really important to being able to interpret what you see in that image. Okay, last clicker question. This, <laughs> this I have not covered super carefully, but it's important to know before you go home for you know, Thanksgiving and say, hey, mom, dad, buy me a telescope. Rank them, so put, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, enter. Um, but, you know, for the order of importance, if you're going to buy a telescope. Is that your option? What was that? Oh, oh yeah. rank them. Yeah, rank them. So you're going to put all six in and then hit enter. From, you're going to put the numbers 1 through 6 in the order of priority. So like your highest priority you put in first. Okay, based on your rankings, you had, this was number one, this was number two, this was number three, four, five, six. Now, I know you're going to a career fair. The most important thing in a telescope should be, and I'll put mine in red, should be the diameter of the objective. That's your number one thing. Bigger is better. Spend your money on the size. Number two is going to be the quality of the optics, because without quality optics, you're you know, not going to be so great. After that, these things here kind of depend on your usage. You know, if you're going to be permanently mounting it in a little dome that you have in your backyard, then portability is not an issue. 
If you're going to be put in the back of the car, taking around, it is. The stability of the mount, once again, if, you're if it's portable, the stability matters. If it's permanently mounted, it's going to be stable. Aiming system, I would put three because I hate aiming any way except for pushing a button. Um, magnification is going to be last. It's the least important thing because you just change the eyepiece to change the magnification. That's all. So you can always change the magnification. You can always up the magnification. If it has a big objective and quality optics, you're going to be able to get better magnification with it. Okay. Hi-ho, hi-ho.